while law enforcement um, may deal with kids a hundred times a day, it may be the first time for some kids. And that first time matters. That first impression paves the way for a lot of future interactions. So it's very important in the self-interest of law enforcement to get that right. Have you ever noticed that some of the best ideas come from unexpected places? Your next breakthrough may come from a leader facing similar challenges, but in a completely different sector. Welcome to Chief Influencer. I'm your host, Anthony Shaw. Join us as we explore how today's successful leaders inspire, influence, and connect with others. Chief Influencer is a production of Social Driver and the Communications Board, who have teamed up to spotlight how great leaders and communicators are making their impact in the world. This episode is brought to you by the George Washington University's College of Professional Studies. With in-person and online programs, ranging from master's degrees in public relations strategy to certificate programs in digital communications, GW offers more than just the credentials to help working professionals get ahead. It prepares them to be leaders in their field. As a proud GW graduate myself, I can attest that faculty members combine academic rigor with real-world lessons that can't always be found in textbooks. Check out cps.gwu.edu for more information. I'm so excited to introduce today's guest, Lisa Thoreau, Executive Director of Strategies for Youth. Back in 2004, Lisa initiated a training with 180 officers in the Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority Transit Police to improve police youth interactions, to increase officer skills in working with youth and to support officers' development of innovative approaches to policing large groups of teens in public transit areas. The impacts of her advocacy and training efforts led to an 84% reduction in juvenile arrests by the MBTA Transit Police. Lisa continued to deliver such trainings and see similar results, including for the Cambridge Police Department. In 2009, Lisa founded Strategies for Youth, a nonprofit advocacy and training organization dedicated to improving police youth interactions and reducing disproportionate minority contact. Strategies for Youth is now a nationally known organization, providing its training, outreach programs, and policy reviews in 25 states. Lisa has been consulted by the U.S. Department of Justice and the U.S. Department of Education, as well as state agencies, on policing's impacts on youth, as well as policy development, stra uh, statutory reforms, and recommendations for best practices. Lisa writes and speaks on these topics to a wide array of police, youth advocates, and legal audiences. I'm so excited to dive into how this one training turned into a national organization. Lisa, welcome to Chief Influencer. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful to meet you and speak with you about strategies for youth. Well, I can tell how passionate you are about, um, you know, <laughs> making the world a better place through the trainings and the, you know, policy guidance that you provide, because we certainly have challenges um, when it comes to these issues. I wondered if you could kind of take us back a little bit. You know, many people, you um, find different strategies to influence others. You created an organization to scale something that you found worked. So how did that come to be? I'd love to hear a little bit more of the story. Well, very quickly, our origin story is that um, I uh, sued the MBTA Transit Police with a great law firm in uh, 2001 in Boston because we saw many kids being arrested under the zero tolerance policy for either uh, trespassing or uh, disorderly conduct when they were taking the subway to go to school. And they had to take the subway or the bus to go to school because the Boston Public Schools no longer offered uh, transportation. And we kept saying, why are you arresting them for taking public transit to go to school? And why are so many kids of color being arrested? Uh, when it's uh, it's actually a rather uh, varied population that's using the transit system. And um, to my uh, surprise and dismay, I quickly learned that law enforcement in Massachusetts back in uh, 2001 was neither trained to work with youth nor um, given policies to guide their interactions with youth. And this was true of the MBTA Transit Police. 
So we brought a lawsuit and the lawsuit was rather bruising for the um, 11 plaintiff youths we had uh, represented. Um, the attorney uh, for the MBTA basically told the parents that he uh, would destroy the children on the stand if they did not settle. And um, I I blinked at that um, and the parents did too, sadly, because uh, the kids were already traumatized by the arrest. And so it kind of clicked in me that lawsuits on behalf of youth may be necessary, but they are not the only way to affect change in how law enforcement treats youth. And after doing a training with the MBTA and seeing such an impact and so many light bulbs going off in the officers saying, oh my God, I had no idea. Um, this is a better way to do it. This creates much less resistance and rage uh, from youth and from the community, frankly. Uh, I started offering that training in other parts of um, the Metro Boston area. And As a result of that, um, yeah, you're, just, you're going where I was wondering. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I kept seeing these declines. Sometimes it would take two or three years in arrest because it takes a while uh, to change uh, perspectives. And uh, people like Commissioner Haas at the Cambridge Police Department and folks um, in Everett, uh, Steve Macy, who was the chief then, and um, other places like Nantucket, very, very different places in terms of wealth and demographics, all were seeing that a developmental approach that takes into account how kids see the world and process it and respond to it was effective in reducing arrest rates and effective in reducing the strife that is normative between authority figures in this age group. How did that lead you to create an organization to scale that training and that model? Um, well, I said, damn, you know, if this is working and if the MBTA now is interested and, and I went to the new chief of the MBTA Transit Police, Joe Carter, and I said, look, we could be enemies or allies. Let's work together. Let's create policies. Let's create training. And I need you to back me up to train the officers. Uh, when we saw that model work, I said, uh, we have to do more in so many places because I had this strong sense of urgency that fueled my passion that a lot of kids were getting harmed for no good reason. And we had to stand up and stop that. Um, unfortunately, most juvenile justice reform starts further down um, the pipes after a kid has been arrested, after a kid is system involved in the courts or in uh, detention or incarceration. I kept saying, wait, if we want to address racial disparities, we have to go where they're the greatest, which uh, was typically and probably still is arrest. And that means going upriver. And we have to change the way gatekeepers see kids. And at that point, um, 2008, um, I had left my previous position and I wrote a white paper uh, stating what my vision would be and uh, began Strategies for Youth in 2009. And I, I would have to say I made one enormous mistake, which is my urgency and um, the, the fear I had for young people was so strong that I just went to work right away. I did not... Uh, do what most people do, which is try to get funding first. I mm -hmm. immediately started scraping together whatever we could in the way of little dollars to make the case that this training was effective. And that mistake, sadly, um, has uh, dogged me for the last 13 years since Strategies has been around 14 years, um, because the lack of political will and financial support for reforming how law enforcement interacts with youth is, is rather low, um, even though law enforcement really wants it and really needs it in their own words, they tell us that. And uh, really some of the most difficult officers, sometimes like the SWAT officers who you think are all about violence are like, no, I wish we had had this. Mm -hmm. And um, the compliments we've gotten from officers who typically resort to use of force or uh, nonverbal, non de escalation approaches with young people have said, Wow, you know, I wish I'd known this at the beginning of my career. And this has happened so often that uh, most of our business has grown by word of mouth. Hmm. 
You know, okay, so I'm not an expert at all on this issue, but it strikes me when I think back to the first training you delivered, um, you know, there was a like a, a mandate sort of to to do that, you know, because of the 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 lawsuit and everything, but and and but you were able to get them to agree to do it. But now, I mean, you have these these different departments in 25 states that are signing up. And it strikes me that in the law enforcement world saying, hey, we're gonna make I'm going to help you make the community safer by arresting fewer people. You might get some raised eyebrows, but you've you've figured out a way to influence and to get positive feedback, which I've heard you talk about from you know, the SWAT and captains and other things. Um, so t tell us a little bit about that strategy, about that messaging, about how you can get that to connect in so that these folks are inviting you in to provide these trainings, because it does sound a little counterintuitive um, on the outside that that might resonate with your core audience there. You're absolutely right. And it took me a while to figure that out. I have to say this was a steep learning curve. Um, I have worked with other public agencies like education. It's quite different. Um, law enforcement is much more insular and um, in some ways rightly so because it's hard to imagine um, how a law enforcement officer perceives risk and danger. In other ways, um, you know, social workers are probably the people who die the most on the job, but um, we'll let that be. What we had to learn was how we could make the case without in any way seeming to impinge on the mission of law enforcement um, and instead to uh, bolster and support things that mean a lot to law enforcement. And that was first um, improving the legitimacy of law enforcement in communities, uh, especially communities where they are highly involved and uh, arresting a lot of youth. And that's typically uh, poor communities and communities of color, which are sometimes quite different communities. Um, by no means do I mean to say that community of color are always poor, but I will say there's more law enforcement involvement in low socioeconomic uh, communities across uh, the country and across the racial and ethnic spectrum. And in, uh, what we were offering to them was a way to be more effective when they interacted with youth, to avoid escalation, avoid use of force, avoid complaints against their system, and be something of a troubleshooter um, to support the best possible interactions between law enforcement and youth. And what we saw um, to our surprise was that there were law enforcement leaders across the country all too willing to do this uh, because so few uh, states, in fact, um, very few academies spend more than four to five hours even preparing recruits to uh, to learn how to work with youth. And that's mostly legal preparation. It's not the actual personal communication skills. Same thing uh, with uh, skills-based training for officers through in-service training. There's no mandated training in the United States for in-service uh, training for officers. And you're like, wait a minute, you're not giving them policies. You're not giving them training what are you relying on to ensure that this group that we recognize in the law is vulnerable is going to be treated properly? And uh, the answer is nothing. And so that was the void we tried to fill. And sometimes it was very easy to make the case, especially after a, a, a law enforcement agency had been sued, that they needed to change their ways. And um, there really are some wonderfully progressive chiefs around the country who got it and wanted to do it and uh, then could see the impacts. So influencing law enforcement agencies is obviously a major part of the work that you do. Um, but also you've developed strategies to influence youth, to connect with youth. A very different audience, obviously, an important one for you, but you know, very different from a, a police chief. Can you talk about the work that you're doing in that space? Yes, and thanks for bringing that up. Our juvenile justice jeopardy games aim to educate youth about the legal jeopardy they may find themselves in when they behave certain ways. I mean, in the United States, we're always telling kids, you have this right, you have that right. If an officer does this to you, you should do that to them. And actually, it's much more complicated than that. And what are we leaving out? We are leaving out what their legal obligations are. And so that's where kids are getting tripped up. 
And so as always, I was always trying to ferret out where the um, this juncture was between what is available and what is needed. And with youth, what we wanted to do was basically warn them about how the juvenile justice system works, um, some best practices for interactions with law enforcement based on some of the things law enforcement was telling us, and um, some opportunities to build their confidence about what to do if an officer pat frisks you. Like I think in 18 years of um, playing the juvenile justice jeopardy game, I've had two groups of youth say, yes, a male police officer may pat frisk a female. Um, that means <laughs> all the other games I've played, the youth have thought, no, an officer cannot pat frisk a, a girl if the officer is male and she can push him away, which is automatically gonna lead to an arrest. So basic information like this we felt was necessary as well as Miranda rights. And then the game also said, you know, if you do this with your friend, even though your friend is taking the lead in the action, you're going to be held responsible too. And so um, we wanted young people through skits, through this Jeopardy game format to uh, engage in and recognize some of the risks they were taking and be more informed about those risks and consider whether or not they're worth it. All we can do is inform, and we do this through a train the trainer approach, as we do with our policing the teen brain training, to try and um, make sure that community messengers who already have legitimacy and trust of young people can learn this key information to help avoid their system involvement. Now, sometimes they can do everything right and they'll still get system involved. And we warn them of that and we recognize that, but we want also them to understand what to do when that happens and to in many ways support them. And so now I think we started with two versions of the game. Now we have 14 because what we're trying to do is stop and plug up every pipeline of kids becoming involved in the juvenile legal system. And, and so when we do this work with young people, we get um, a nod from law enforcement, like, yeah, the kids need to know that if they open up a conversation with FU man, um, it's not gonna go well. Um, and, and kids may do that out of traumatic experiences and out of fear. We're saying to them, this is a better way to do it and keep things from escalating. Just as we're telling law enforcement, forget about de-escalating, don't escalate in the first place. When you behave this way, you're escalating a kid's fear. You're escalating and triggering any past trauma they may have had with law enforcement. And frankly, any law enforcement officer who's not aware of transgenerational or immediate trauma of youth of color is just not really fit to interact with the youth. You have to be aware of that in 2023. And certainly the last three years have uh, explained why that's important too. So together we were dealing with educational interventions for both. With law enforcement, we've gone one step further by creating the policies, our 12 model law enforcement policies which uh, for youth interactions, which we released in November to then concretize what we've prepared in the trainings and to prepare law enforcement to work as effectively as possible with young mm -hmm. people who come into their system. And those, those can be victims. Those can be children watching their parent being arrested. This can uh, relate to things at the investigatory stop moment or during an interrogation. Um, and this also relates to uh, how officers treat kids in schools and what officers and agencies need to provide in the way of material to the community to explain what's happening to their kids. Because one thing I learned in Cleveland after Tamir Rice was shot to death by an officer, uh, frankly, for absolutely no reason, and in a manifestation of his poor training and absence of any kind of policy for dealing with kids, if you do not have a contract with your community in the form of a set of policies about what you will do to a child, when you will use force, when you will use restraints, how you will treat them, in certain situations as a law enforcement officer with all this legal and gun power, you're not really uh, effectively doing any form of community policing as so many law enforcement agencies claim they are doing. So that's why we invested so much time and energy and so many people in creating these 12 model law enforcement policies, the first of their kind in the United States. 
uh, to do this. We wanted to make sure that each law enforcement agency could guide its officers to use a developmentally appropriate, trauma-informed, equitable set of practices and point of view for their interactions with youth. And we wanted to fill that yawning gap in the United States, which does not equip its officers mm -hmm. at all. What talk more about that and what kind of feedback you're getting? Then I actually want to go back a little bit to the to Jeopardy, but let's talk about the the policies and um, you know what that journey looks like and the type of feedback you're getting, not only from you know police, but from maybe from the public. I'd love to know what kind of public support there is for the work that you're talking about. Well, um, we approached it this way because our in individual efforts with individual law enforcement agencies were unavailing. We would say, you know, we, we've looked at your policies and this isn't covered and that isn't covered and it would be good if it was covered. And, um, you know, the consent decrees coming out of the U.S. Department of Justice are demanding policies that address this. You know, and we, we really push the DOJ to include kids when they investigated police departments starting in 2016, and they listened to us. And so since then, um, especially after Cleveland um, and the killing of Tamir Rice, who I might remind everyone was 12 years old um, and standing next to a swing set, uh, we have seen that in Baltimore and Chicago, there was some focus on how law enforcement is treating kids. And this is really important because those kids tend to grow up and stay in the city they grew up in and then have more interactions with law enforcement. And so um, when we kept getting this pushback uh, because either unions would have to sign off on the policies and didn't want to, or simply chiefs said, no way, I'm not gonna rock the boat, we're not doing this. I said, okay, um, if they won't do it proactively, we're gonna recommend uh, four target groups consider it. And that was law enforcement leadership across the United States. That was legislators and legislatures. That was community advocates, police reform advocates, and youth advocates, such as juvenile defense attorneys. And uh, finally, insurance companies that insure law enforcement agencies and can pay out sometimes millions of dollars for the temporary or permanent damage law enforcement causes children. And um, this has had a mixed response, I'll be honest. Some law enforcement has said, forget it. They won't even uh, consider it. And others have said, I want this for my agency now. I don't care what the state says. I wanna go beyond what the floor is. And the floor in most states is so low, I can't really identify it. There are no state mandated policies about what law enforcement agencies should do in the way of um, policies for interactions with youth, much less training, no training, no policies being required. So um, we have had um, very interested responses from juvenile defenders and some advocacy groups that are in this space. Um, what we're hoping to do next, and we are just hampered by lack of funding, is to really uh, go towards the legislatures because that is where we're seeing a tremendous array of very good reforms across the United States. And so that's our next goal as well as uh, stomping um, the ground um, across the United States to make people realize that policies are very complicated and difficult to write. My co-author, Shelley Jackson, formerly of the uh, US Department of Justice, uh, wrote these policies with me. And it took us 18 months to collect all the evidence to substantiate it, to make the case and to say a developmentally appropriate, trauma-informed, equitable approach is going to lead not only to the best outcomes for youth, and by best, I mean what serves youth, but also for law enforcement agencies, uh, seeing reduction in complaints, reduction in lawsuits, as well as increase legitimacy because they're treating youth right. And mm -hmm. I'll just tell you one story to segue back to Juvenile Justice Jeopardy. We worked uh, a lot in Indiana and have worked with the Indiana Metropolitan Police Department. And one of the things we brought to them was our Juvenile Justice Jeopardy game. And they created a team of officers that would go play the game in many um, public housing areas. And uh, I got a call one day after the game started being played, I think back in 2015 or 2016. 
and a commander of the third district, uh, James Waters, who unfortunately is, has passed, uh, said, I can't tell you how grateful uh, we are for the Jeopardy game because when parents saw that our officers were coming in to prevent their children from getting arrested, they helped us serve, uh, solve a, a murder in, in that housing project within two days instead of oh. two years. And so this is what I'm talking about, this contract, this community agreement um, and dialogue with law enforcement is key, especially when it comes to youth. Yeah, yeah, I really like the the Jeopardy game is something for us to all hear about and think about because um, you, you there's some themes there that jump out at me. One is, you know, you created an engaging experience to sort of level the playing field in those cases and to you know, bring folks together around something. But also you mentioned there's misinformation that, you know, um, youth might believe something to be true about their interactions that isn't true. And, you know, nobody wants to, um, nobody wants to believe things that are false, right? It's just, we have heard some things that so we believe it. And so when you can help educate people about things they care about and dispel misinformation, um, and help them get the right information. I think that's powerful and doing that in an engaging way is good. And that just like what you've done with youth, I mean, that could work inside of a corporation that could work with a membership group that could work. I mean, you, know, you could, you could adapt that to many different audiences and communities, but thinking about, you know, rather than just send in an email or writing a paper or something, you know, some of the things we often try that, that, fall flat. You know, how many people in a company have said, somebody said, oh, I didn't know we had that benefit. And it's like, oh, we've emailed it out like 10 times or the whole company. Well, we all know you can't just do one thing uh, repeatedly. We have to try different tactics. And so I love the the game as an example of how you can be creative in that engagement. Well, we, we tried to look at what pedagogy says works best with young people, but we found it also works really well with adults. And with young people, it's storytelling and a game engagement where they have to test what they know and compete with each other. Uh, adults like it too. And so we've brought Jeopardy games uh, all over the place. We were playing in uh, Birmingham um, September a year ago and uh, we invited the parents to watch their kids play. And uh, we had to ask the parents to stop participating because the kids couldn't get a word in edgewise, but the parents didn't know the answers. Law enforcement yeah. didn't know the answers is what, we often hear back from law enforcement. They go, wow, I didn't know this. I didn't know the law. Um, and that, again, goes to my original point that we have to do the yin and yang of this. We have to educate the kids and we have to educate law enforcement. And you gain legitimacy with both groups if you tell the other you're training the other. So yeah. when we we listen to kids tell us stories and experiences they have with officers, we say, thank you. We'll let the chief know that this is happening out there. And we have had kids tell us some terribly uh, disturbing stories about law enforcement and some fantastic stories about how law enforcement has protected them. But um, it's kind of striking that um, it's so difficult to get prevention even considered. So we're all about after the fact in the United States, prevention is just given short shrift and that's what people like about this Jeopardy game. So we have district attorneys, we have schools, we have juvenile defenders, we have after school programs playing this. And then we've even been funded by state bar associations to do it in detention centers with youth because you have a captive audience there saying, but, 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 and you can discuss it with them. And kids are so hungry to have this conversation. They want to know, they really, really want to know. And it's shameful we aren't doing more to answer their questions. Can you um, talk a little bit about how you've used research to inform this, but also inform um, just like the, the public will? I know you had um, a survey recently, um, and maybe you can share a bit about that and how that's informed this work. Oh, I'm so glad you asked about that. Yes, we commissioned uh, a survey through Lincoln Park Strategies. And what we were trying to do is in preparation of releasing our policies, we said, let's ask how much uh, the American public thinks law enforcement agencies have policies for interactions with youth and have training for interactions with youth. And thanks to funding from the Five Together Foundation, uh, we were able to fund this um, 
poll. And what we found is 56% of Americans thought that law enforcement agencies have policies for youth interactions. Well, there's no official count, but uh, even organizations like the International Association of Chiefs of Police, you frequently see pleading for agencies to adopt policies for interactions with youth because so few have them. And the 80% of small law enforcement agencies have even fewer <laughs> than the other 20%. So uh, that was a remarkable finding. But then you saw even higher numbers for the expectation that law enforcement was being trained, trained to work with kids generally, trained to work with them in the school. And I'm talking 60 to 80 percent expectation that specific ways of dealing with kids or kids in distress was being addressed. And it's not. Uh, the other thing we found was a very strong support, like 80% of the respondents uh, with an additional 7%, I think, saying I'm not sure, um, wanted officers to go the distance to ensure that young people understood their Miranda rights and, uh, and that uh, I think it's closer to 87% wanted a lawyer present when the kid was being interrogated. Now, this is a big issue in legislatures across the country right now, both the presence of an attorney being accorded by the state, as well as whether or not um, the interrogation should be recorded and whether or not officers can use uh, deceit and deception. Um, and all of this is highly important um, in the juvenile realm because kids falsely confess to get the heck out of there as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, when they falsely confess, they're not getting out of there typically. They're gonna be detained right. um, until trial. And so uh, we, we really were um, thrilled to see support for what we're arguing for in our policies, that there be a lawyerly presence at the point of Miranda warnings and during in any interrogation to avoid these miscarriages of justice and the harm to public safety, because if you get a false confession, you, you haven't caught the person who's done the harm. So we think that these things that we've proposed both even the playing field and um, help us achieve our mission, which is to ensure that any interaction with law enforcement will yield the best possible outcomes for young people. Yeah, it's really, um, when you think about, you know, how do I influence these different audiences, you know, using that research, using that survey to show that the public's expectation is that you're doing these things that we're saying you should do, but that you're not doing. <laughs> and so I think building that support that way is is really interesting. And another way you've just done it is through um, champions of the work that you've done. And I wondered, you said early on about how you kind of converted an enemy into an ally. Um, and I know you have some other examples of advocates, and, you know, early adopters who've become advocates and, and are sharing their stories. I think that's such an important thing for anybody to do in the world of influences. You know, it's always great for us to talk about ourselves, but it's great if some third party validates us, particularly when they are a peer of the audience you're trying to, to connect Absolutely. with because they're going to believe that. So tell me more about that. Well, um, I have no marketing background. In fact, I have no business background. It's not entirely clear. I know what I'm doing some days. But what I thought was, since we were outsiders, and because I'm a white female and um, you know probably frizzy-haired and perceived to come from Cambridge, Massachusetts, so I'm the enemy incarnate, um, I needed law enforcement to see the value of what we're doing to persuade other law enforcement officers and agencies that this served them well. And that's what happened. Um, it, it cannot be forced in law enforcement. It has to be kind of uh, accreted and done insidiously and wherever we could. Um, and we just uh, released a, an interview with a, a wonderful officer, Brian Lowe in Tippecanoe, Indiana, talking about how much the training change the officer's perception of youth, effectiveness with youth, and their general sense of moral ease um, in what they had done. Some were very honest and, and said to me, I was really ashamed of what I did. And I appreciate your teaching us this other way because I feel much better. I don't feel so nauseated after I've done something way too harsh and, and have to recognize later I there was another way to do it. 
And so one chief said um, something to me. He said, Lisa, you just have to tell people there is another way. And you have to tell them that while law enforcement um, may deal with kids 100 times a day, it may be the first time for some kids. And that first time matters. That first impression paves the way for a lot of future interactions. So it's very important in the self-interest of law enforcement to get that right. Yeah, that's such a great that's such a great point um, that I think a lot of leaders have to remember something that they interaction they may have all the time. On the other end of the equation, it might be the first time, and that might shape, you know, the future in a way that they didn't even realize. That's a great point. We uh, also, know, we, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, we had to learn, um, and and my background is anthropology as well as law, and so what I had to learn. Um, was to listen to where officers were struggling and make sure that our training, even though we had an agenda for the training, always responded to what law enforcement was saying was where the struggle happened, where the power struggle was occurring and offer very practical solutions. So it doesn't matter if officers know where the hippocampus is and what it does in terms of trauma, it does matter that officer knows to look for the signs of a traumatic response and how mm. to respond to it. And so that's what I think makes our training special, including the fact that we have a psychologist leading that and working through what those practical applications are in scenarios and examples. Mm. That's fantastic. Um, Lisa, as we kind of get to our close, one of the things I wanted to just ask you is um, if there are places outside of the law or the justice system where you have found inspiration for how you influence others, whether that's policymakers, you know, the, the law enforcement folks, youth, um, because we hear from a lot of our chief influencers that they get sources of inspiration for how they influence, you know, outside of the, the usual zone folks may expect. I get inspiration from a couple of places. One is uh, talking with people who are just magical with youth and they can be officers, they can be youth workers, they can be teachers. They just seem to feel and understand and can't even always articulate, but if they let me watch them, I can see how they do things and then take inspiration from that. I take a lot of inspiration uh, from literature and reading widely. And I take a lot of inspiration from kids um, at, who explain what would have made them comply, what would have been helpful to them at that moment in their life. And we try to incorporate that and integrate that um, in everything we do. And uh, we, we are living in such a richly intense realm when it comes to kids and law enforcement. It's constantly fascinating. and anyone who's interested in some of the research that exists on this can look at our website at strategiesforyouth.org because the amount of scholarship since 2000 on this topic has quintupled and we try to summarize and review it and make it available to the public so that they too can learn um, and be inspired about what works. And there are things that are working and there are some great officers out there doing great things every day who don't get the recognition they deserve. Mm -hmm. You know, with so much negative stuff in the news these days, it's really inspirational to hear about the work that you're doing, Lisa. Um, we've interviewed all kinds of chief influencers. And, you know, one of the things that you showed us is when you see something that works and there's a gap, sometimes you just have to create your own organization to, to scale that beyond what you can personally do. And it's really amazing to see how you've gone from from one training that, you know, kind of had to twist some folks' arms to make happen to now folks inviting you into 25 states and growing and not just to um, connect with law enforcement, but you said something that really resonated with me about that sort of two-sided influence equation that you go for with youth as well. You said each one of them knowing that you're training the other adds legitimacy, right? It's not just that, you know, my side has a deficit. Both sides are getting trained so that we can learn how to work together. And of course, one of the ways that you've done that so effectively is through juvenile justice jeopardy, which, you know, even parents uh, like and are getting involved with. So I hope folks will check out 
your website. And I know you're getting some news coverage and just follow the work that you all are doing. And I just want to say thank you for being part of Chief Influencer. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you again. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Chief Influencer, a production of Social Driver and the Communications Board. If you know a leader who should be featured as a chief influencer, please nominate them at chiefinfluencer.org. For show notes and more, visit us at chiefinfluencer.org or follow Chief Influencer on LinkedIn. Until next time.